So he said, okay, the thing that distinguishes R from, from Q is this least upper bound axiom, right? The completeness axiom that, you know, if you have any set, any non-empty set of real numbers, um, if S has an upper bound, then S has a least upper bound. Right. So any set with an upper bound has a, a, a least upper bound. Right. A real. Uh, you know, there's some number in R that acts as its least upper bound. Okay. Um, and uh, um, you notice that we we do not give the, the opposite statement that any set with a lower bound has a greatest lower bound, right? We don't give some sort of like uh, glum, you know, glum, you know, greatest lower bound axiom. There's nothing like that, right? And the reason is that we can take the least upper bound axiom and turn it into a greatest lower bound statement, right? So we can prove as a consequence the following theorem that um, Again, if uh, S is a non-zero uh, set subset of the reals, um, and if S has a lower bound, then it has a greatest lower bound. Has a greatest lower bound. So we don't need to we don't need to assume that that's um, that's just that's a consequence of the least upper bound axiom. Okay. So um, <coughs> okay. So uh, does anybody know the idea of the proof? What's the idea of the proof? Anybody looked at it? Or can any yeah, can anybody guess guess what we're going to do? Right, we have we're going to use the least upper bound axiom to prove this, right? So you have some set S, you have some set S, it has a lower bound, right? Your set S, you know, maybe has no upper bound, right? S is in some, some set, it has a lower bound, right? Uh, M, little m. Okay. Yeah, Nick? Can we multiply everything in the set by negative one? Exactly. So that's what we'll do. We'll just turn everything over and then use the least upper bound axiom on that set. You know, get some get some least upper bound for the for the flip set. Take negative of that and say that's going to be our greatest lower bound. Okay. So that's that's exactly what we do. Say so, okay. Um, let's say that um, S uh, has a lower bound. In other words, um, m is less than or equal to s uh, for all for all s and s. Right? Suppose it has a lower bound, but then uh, we know that if you multiply, we now know that if you multiply by negative one, you reverse the order. Right? So negative m is bigger than negative s for all s and s, right? Um, and we introduce a notation. Um, uh, let negative s denote the set of all negative s's where s is an element of s. So you just take everybody in s and you flip them over, multiply them by negative one. So let negative s denote this, and what we're saying is that then this negative m is an upper bound of, of negative s. Bound, then by the least upper bound axiom, um, negative 
MS as a least of the bound. Call it um, S not. And then uh, we claim that uh, negative S naught is actually the greatest lower bound of S. In other words, that that um, negative S naught is less than or equal to S for all S and S, and if T is a lower bound of S, then T must be smaller than negative S naught. Okay. Um, so this is actually going to be part of your homework to finish this last last part of the of the thing. certain properties of, of the real numbers that um, are actually consequences of the of the least upper bound uh, axiom um, and they they might seem sort of um, sort of obvious but in fact um, they rely on the least upper bound axiom okay so um, the first of these is something called the Archimedean property Archimedean. Suppose that you have let x and y um, be both positive numbers. Okay. Then there exists a number, a natural number, such that um, nx is bigger than y. So um, that might seem like it's completely obvious, but in fact, to prove it, um, you have to use the uh, you have to use the least upper bound property, least upper bound axiom. So um, so here's the proof. Say so, okay. Um, so we do it by con by contradiction. Suppose there is no there is no n such that nx is bigger than y. Right. No matter how many, no matter what you know, multiply by x by, you never get bigger than y. Okay. In other words, um, nx is less than or equal to y for all natural numbers. Okay. 
Um, you can see what we're going to do. What are we going to do? We're going to use the least upper bound property, right? So. We say, okay, y is bigger than nx for all for all n, right? So y is an upper bound for the set of nx's, right? So in other words, y is an upper bound, upper bound for the set nx, where n is a natural number, right? But then, then by the least upper bound property, by the least bound axiom, um, uh, uh, let's call this set A. Um, there exists a least upper bound of A. Call it alpha. So this says the set of, of nx where n is any any natural number. So this is 1x, 2x, 3x, all all anything, all all possible nx's where n is a natural number. It's not not just one of them, it's it's all of them. Okay. Okay. Um, now can so Consider alpha minus x. Right. Notice alpha minus x is smaller than alpha because x is positive. So what does that tell you? Right. Since alpha minus x is less than alpha, right? Alpha, the least upper bound of a. What do you know? What do you know about alpha minus x? It's less than the least upper bound. It's less than the least upper bound. If it's less than the least upper bound of a, then what do you know about it? It's not, it's not an upper, upper bound. bound. It's not an upper bound, right? It's smaller than the least upper bound. Right, you've got all these upper bounds of A, right? And you've got the least upper bound, and alpha minus x is smaller than that. Right? So alpha minus x can't be can't be an upper bound, right? So um, alpha minus x is not an upper bound of A. Right? In other words, there must be some be some element of A there must be some element of A um, such that that element is bigger than alpha minus x There must be somebody, right? There must be some multiple, there must be some multiple of x that exceeds this alpha minus x, right? For it, because we just said it's not an upper bound, right? If it's not an upper bound, that means that there must be somebody in A that's bigger than you, right? Otherwise, you are an upper bound. Okay? So does, you, does, you see, does, does anybody see uh, what's going to happen here? So we get alpha minus x is less than n naught x. Right? There's some n naught in the naturals. Something something funny happens. Alpha 
is less than n naught plus 1 x. Right? Alpha is less than n naught plus 1 x. But this n naught plus 1 is still a natural number. Right? Contradiction, right? Because this n naught plus 1 is in, alpha, is in a, is in a, but alpha was supposed to be um, the least upper bound of a. Right? But we found somebody in A who's bigger than alpha. Okay. So the, what we see is that if, if alpha is the least upper bound of A, then alpha is not the least upper bound of A. Right? It's not even an upper bound of A. Okay. So it's a contradiction. So in other words, there must must be some point where uh, these nx's exceed exceed y. So does that mean that there's just no bounds at all? That's what we proved. Yeah. Well, I mean, so this is. Uh, um, uh, uh, the analogy that they give in the book is um, uh, you have a bathtub and you have a spoon. Okay. <laughs> you have a bathtub, y is the bathtub, x is the spoon, and that eventually you can empty the bathtub with the spoon. Right? At some point, you have, but at, after some, you know, at some natural number, you're going to have moved more, more water than is in the tub out. You can, you can, you can empty the tub. Yeah. Okay, so that's that's what this says. That's what the Archimedean property says. Um, and next time we'll see that, as a consequence of this, um, we'll get something called the uh, uh, that Q is dense in R. The density density property um, that uh, given any given any x and y. Where x is less than less than y, uh, there exists a rational number between those two. There exists a rational number between them. Right? So, given any two numbers, given any two real numbers, there's always going to be a rational number between them. Okay. So this speaks to sort of some sort of like, like how how you know thickly the, the rational numbers are interspersed in the real numbers. Okay. Yeah, I remember being in ninth grade and trying to justify something by saying, because of the density of the rational numbers. And the geometry professor said, where is this kid from, Mars? <laughs> uh, I stopped saying things. <laughs> But, it, but I was, it was right. I was, uh, the question was basically, you know, why can you run infinitely many, infinitely lines through a point? And right? you say, well, you know, this is basically the same thing as a you know, density, right? Like between any two slopes, you're going to have another rational slope. Right? Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> thus, thus was my curiosity quashed. <laughs> <laughs> But no, I actually, I, I actually really enjoyed that class. Um, the, and the, the, the teacher was good, except for that one stomp statement. Okay, that's it for today.